Good to see all of you. How come there's so many people here? What is there, a quiz tomorrow or something? Yeah. All right. Okay, so here, here's my plan of attack. So first of all, I, I kind of butchered a few things last week. I apologize to those of you who are here, have watched the video, or will watch the video. I think I corrected pretty much everything that went wrong along the way, which was, as I said, a few little things here and there. But the last one was an example that I did, and it was so bad that I didn't have time to do it again. Uh, so I'm going to start with that. And then after I've done that, I'm kind of going to open the floor for the quiz. Um, you know, we've only done a few weeks, so I'm not going to do a review of everything we've just reviewed, but um, I presume that you've looked over the previous examples, uh, previous quizzes, and there were no solutions to one of the quizzes, so we could go through that one as well. So I, I kind of leave it up to you. And when you've run out of questions to ask me about the previous material, then we'll move on with some new material that isn't relevant for the quiz, but is relevant for the midterm, which is coming up pretty soon anyway. All right, so before I take questions, let me redo the example that I did at the end of the time, which is from chapter two, so totally fair game, but I just kind of screwed it up, as I said. So let's see. I got some of it right, but I'll do the whole example again. You're given that T from R2 to R2 is linear. It's a linear transformation. So it's going to be represented by a two by two matrix. And you're given that T of three, one, that vector is two, five. And also that T of, where's it gone? One, two is minus one, zero. And you're asked to find the matrix that is that represents T. Or more specifically, find a matrix A so that T of X, this is the function T evaluated at the vector X, is equal to A times X. That's a matrix times a vector. I'm repeating myself for many times over, but it's sort of important to understand that this is t of x, of x, plus f of x whereas this, this is a times x, where this is a matrix times a vector. So that's the question. All right, now, if we knew what t of 1, 0 and t of 0, 1 were, we could just write down the matrix. So as an alternative question, let's suppose a much simpler question had been like this. Suppose we know t of 1, 0 is equal to, I'll pick different vectors just so as not to confuse anything, and t of 0, 1 is equal to minus 7, minus 9. Then what's the matrix of t? Well, we can write it down directly. A is just the matrix 3, 4, minus 7, minus 9. And that works because 1, 0, and 0, 1 are the coordinate basis vectors. There's still a few chairs over here and here. I don't know, uh, yep, there's one, whoops, there's one over there. You can move that one. You can move stuff around, move this one around. You know, the floor is not that comfortable, so it's up to you. All right, so that's important to understand. Okay, let's just do a reality check and see why it works. Multiply this by 1, 0, and you'll see that you get 3, 4 you pick out the first column. Whereas if you multiply by 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 times 3 plus 1 times minus 7. So this goes over here, and you do indeed get minus 7, and then you repeat the exercise for the bottom to get minus 9. So if that were the question, it would be quite simple. Unfortunately, these are not the standard basis vector, so we have to be a little more clever. The main thing to realize is that you can write these equations in the matrix form as a times 3, 1, and then 1, 2, is equal to 2, 5, minus 1, 0. OK, why is it true? Well, it's to do with the definition of matrix multiplication, or one of the ways of looking at the definition. I'm sorry, the room is not quite big enough. OK, just to remind you 
as an aside, if you have a, a matrix times another matrix whose columns are V1, V2, and so on, Vm, we'll assume that there's M of them, then this is the matrix AV1, AV2, and so on, up to AVM. That's a nice fact. That's a really nice fact. Bless you. Of course, the dimension of these vectors could be different from these vectors. These are all the same, maybe N, and these are all the same, maybe P, and it depends on the size of the matrix A, which will tell you. So I've kind of drawn them a little bit different. But you see, I've combined these two facts into one fact. Technically, maybe I should even put parentheses around there because it's the function. But the same thing would be true if this was A times 3, 1. Okay, so I made it up to there, and that was fine. Now, what I screwed up is that I multiplied by the inverse of this, and I claimed that we could multiply this, take the inverse and put it on the other side, and do this. And I went ahead and computed it, and then at, right at the end, someone said, oh, you made a mistake. And I said, ah, oh, yes, I made a mistake. What mistake did I make? Why can't you can't do that, OK? <laughs> More precisely, I multiplied on the right instead of the left. OK, let's call this B, and let's call this C. So this says A, B equals C. If I do what I just did and multiply both sides by B inverse on the left, then I will get B inverse A, B equals B inverse C. That's true, but this left side is not the same as A. It's not the same as A because the matrices do not commute in general. Most times they don't. If they did, you could reverse the AB and you get B inverse BA, which would be A. So this is wrong. The correct thing to do is to multiply on the right on both sides. So from this equation, the alternative from AB equals C is to say that A equals CB inverse. That's true. That's true. So what I should have done from here is put this inverted on the right. I need to write instead A equals 2, 5, minus 1, 0 times 3, 1, 1, 2 inverse. It looks very similar, but of course the order matters. Okay, then the next thing to do is to take the inverse. Now for 2 by 2 matrices, I described this last time to a vastly smaller audience, that all you have to do is, for, well there's three steps. One is to switch the diagonal elements. So that becomes 2 and 3. And then stick a minus in front of each of the off diagonal elements, which happen to be the same. But you also have to divide, which I'll pull all the way out to the front, by the determinant. 3 times 2 is 6, minus 1 times 1. So I'll write this as 1 over 3 times 2, minus 1 times 1. And so this is a fifth. So this is 1 fifth, and then I've got to multiply these two matrices together. So what do I get? I get 2 times minus 2 times 2. So before I start, I'm going to go this with this. 2 times 2 is 4. Minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. That gives me a 5. OK, this with this. 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. Minus 3 is negative 5. Now this and this. 2 times 5 is 10. And the 0 goes away. And then this and this gives me a negative 5. So I get as my matrix, I've got to divide each of these entries by 5. I will get 1 minus 1, 2 minus 1. OK, did I make another mistake? OK, so the question is, what if the determinant of the 2 by 2 matrix is 0? How can you divide by it? Yes, it's kind of bleak. Still no one wants that seat there, or is someone saving it for someone? No? Oh, well. 
Uh, yes, if the determinant is zero, there's no inverse. That's going to be true for any, any size matrix, although we don't know yet how to take the determinant of, say, a 3 by 3 or bigger matrix. But if the determinant is zero, then what that means, in fact, is that one column is a multiple of another column, or one row is a multiple of another row. And then if you do the elimination, you'll get a zero row as a result. Hello. All right, let's do a reality check since I screwed up so many things last time and I don't trust myself anymore. It's actually not a bad idea on the quiz, if you have a few seconds to spare, to come back to your answer. Rather than checking your work, one thing you might do is verify that these things are true. So let's check. It doesn't take very long. 1 minus 1, 2 minus 1 times 3, 1. We should get 2, 5, do we? We get 3 minus 1 is 2, and then we get 6 minus 1, 5. Okay, halfway there. 1 minus 1, 2 minus 1. Let's check the other vector we were given. What was it? 1, 2. Okay, 1 times 1 minus 2 is negative 1, and 2 minus 2 is 0. And that's what we were supposed to get. Okay, had I done that last time, of course, I would have seen I was wrong immediately. But um, there was no time in any case. So any questions about that particular example? Yes? So when you do transformation, the convention is always that you do A <coughs> times the matrix, not the matrix times A. OK, so the question is, when you do, the convention is that it's AX instead of XA. Yeah. But in fact, you cannot multiply X by A because, uh, the, because the dimensions are wrong. So you cannot really write a vector times a matrix unless the vector is a row vector. So you could actually redo all of this linear algebra where vectors are a row vector, but always multiplied on the left. That's not the convention. I mean, you like to see t of x equals ax. So that's why we have to write the vectors. Yes. Uh, the question is how much work to show when you multiply two matrices. Uh, I would have thought it was okay to write it down, but then you see you do leave yourself open to making a mistake, and if you do make a mistake, it may not be clear that you know how to multiply the matrices. I mean, you know, maybe suppose you happen to write down two times two is four, and you obviously don't know how to multiply a matrix. Well, that. The question is, can the grader tell that you know what you're doing and have just made a, a, you know, a careless error, as opposed to have no idea what you're doing? You would expect that the former should get more partial credit. Basically, right? as long as you don't screw up, it's fine. As long as you don't screw up, it's fine. That's, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe that you need to show work specifically. As in, you could write, instead of this 5, you could write 2 times 2 plus minus 1 times minus 1. And this minus 5, you could write 2 times minus 1 plus minus 1 times 3. I don't know if you have to do it. I would suggest that you email your instructor tonight and ask if you're worried about it. I mean, seriously, I, I can't tell because I'm not grading. If I were grading it, I would say that's fine. But maybe some people, do, does anyone know from talking to their instructor how much work you're supposed to show when multiplying two matrices? Does anyone actually have a specific definitive answer from their instructor? I think it's probably fine, but I can't tell because I'm not grading it, okay? But it would be a good idea to find out. All right, any other questions about this example? All right, well, look, I'm at your disposal in terms of answering questions for the quiz tomorrow. I, as I said, I'm not going to go over uh, the theory except as it comes up incidentally in solving some problems. If there are no problems that anyone wants to ask, I'm just going to go over that one quiz that didn't have solutions. But even though some of the other quizzes, all the other quizzes online have solutions, um, they may or may not be clear enough. You may want to go over it. Or, of course, there are homework problems as well that we can go over. Um, I want to kind of avoid the homework problems that are very esoteric, like the one with the road networks. I mean, if you look at the past quizzes, nothing like that seems to come up. There's, there's sort of more basic stuff, but the true false questions are very much fair game because most of the previous quizzes have had true false questions and they can be quite tricky. All right, so 
Uh, okay, I'll I'll be tr you know I'm going to answer only one question in a row and then I'll come back to you go first. Yeah, I have all of the quizzes printed out. Spring 2004. Yeah, some of them I didn't write down what they are. Oh, here we go. That one. Some of them aren't labeled, but this one is number four. Okay, so the question is to find the matrix of reflection across a particular plane. Okay, so it's a three dimensional problem. Consider the plane x plus y minus 2z equals 0. And it says there are several ways to do this problem. Fair enough. I'm going to do the way that I taught last week when I did it. I said, okay, in order to do this, we want to find a reflection here. Okay. So find reflection matrix. All right, so the way I described it is that what I wanted to do was find the projection onto the normal. I, I, I feel like you should know how to find the projection onto a vector. And this is important. So the one formula that you, you can get by doing all of these problems if you know one formula as well as understand the geometry of the situation. Okay, so that's my preferred method rather than trying to learn all these different rules. So here goes. The one formula that you need to know is that if you want to project x onto a specific vector v, this is x dot v over v dot v times v. That's an important formula. We learnt it in Math 201 or the equivalent, and you really can't get by without it. Now, here's what I want to do. Given any plane, there is a normal. And the normal is very easy to find. In this case, not a unit normal, but just a normal. And it doesn't matter whether you use the up or down. A normal is 1, 1, one minus 2. You just read it read it off the plane. It's just the, co the coefficients of x, y, z. By the way, this only works for planes going through the origin. I'm so sorry about the lack of seats. It's, I did not quite expect this uh, turnout, so... It's, it hasn't actually happened except for a night before midterm. So I will certainly get a bigger room for that. I, I apologize. I just didn't anticipate this. Um, anyway, just moving on the best that I can. The, the video also will not be up until after the quiz. So oh, they just keep on coming. Anyone want to sit on the windowsill? Yeah. Projector? The projector's free. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So what I'm saying is, we have the normal. Now, how do you do the reflection in the plane? Here is any old vector x. Here's the normal v. What you have to do is, first of all, you take away one copy of the projection. OK, so I just want to, maybe I should just draw this for a second. Let's, let's put the normal down here a little bit so it's a little clearer. The projection is this. Okay, remember, the projection onto a vector v is a stretched multiple of v. It can't be anywhere else. It's how much of the x vector is like v. So it's like the perpendicular, you're dropping a perpendicular from x onto this line spanned by v, and you're finding where the base of that perpendicular is. Yeah, I was saying that this only works for planes going through the origin. That's what I, that's what I, my previous point was. If, the, if this is not zero, then it's a plane that doesn't go through the origin, and that's not actually a linear transformation. Linear transformations send zero to zero. That's one thing that you would have seen. Any matrix A times zero is zero. So if T is linear, T of zero is zero. And if the plane doesn't go through the origin, then the, the reflection of zero will be somewhere else, and it won't be linear. So it would not even make sense to find a matrix for a reflection if that was not zero. So that was just a little comment. Anyway, back to what I was saying. The normal is some vector v. 
down there. Given any vector x, I can project it onto the line through v. And even if x is down here, the projection will still be down there. But it's in the direction of v, whether that way or that way. Having got that projection now, here's the plane. What I want to do is, if I took it away once, I would get the projection onto the plane. So here is the projection onto the plane. But we don't want the projection onto the plane. The question says, find the reflection. So you actually have to go further. You have to go two times the projection. Two times the projection onto the normal. And that will give you the reflection. OK, so in general, then, we have the projection onto the normal. Let's call that P. So the projection onto the normal. And the projection onto the plane. So projection of x onto the plane is P minus x. And the reflection of x in, I'm sorry, it's not p minus x, it's x minus p, x minus the projection, as I was saying. And the reflection of x in the plane is x minus 2p. So those are the geom... So what I've described to you so far without actually doing the problem at all is, first of all, what a projection onto a vector is, and then second of all, in three dimensions, the three things you can do with those projections. You can either just do the straight projection, you can do the projection onto the plane, or you can do the reflection onto the plane. But if you know what P is, then everything becomes easy. You can just choose which one of these you need and finish the problem. So now let's do, that's just general. Let's do it in this particular case where this is the normal. Okay, first a question. If you have a drawing, you can see of the reflection across a line. Well, it's not normally done, but yes, you could. I would call it more the 180 degree rotation of x across the line. And in fact, given a line and a vector, you can rotate it any. You can pretend that the whole thing's sort of on a. Yeah, and so that's a. It's more like a three dimensional rotation, but that's we're not going to cover that. It's not difficult to do what you want to do. You sort of take the difference and subtract that twice. So it's x minus the projection uh, gives you this vector here. And you take that away twice and whatever it is. So it's probably p minus x or 2p two, two minus. I don't know what it is, but you can do it. It's not, it's not examinable, so I, I won't cover it. But I do want to solve this particular problem now. So I'm kind of going to be able to do all three of them once we, once we have this projection matrix. So with V equals 1, 1, minus 2, which came straight from the question, it might be worth computing. Well, well, let's let's work, 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 work it out. Proj x onto V is equal to x dot 1, 1, minus 2 over 1, 1, minus 2 dot itself times 1, 1, minus 2. And let's just simplify this a little bit. The bottom is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 times 2 times 2, which is 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6. So this is 1 sixth x dot 1, 1, minus 2 times 1, 1, minus 2. OK? So to find the matrix of any linear transformation, as we saw in this problem here, it's very helpful to know where 1, 0, and 0, 1 go. Well, here it's three dimensions. So we kind of had to say, where does 1, 0, 0 go? So projection of 1, 0, 0 onto V is, you just plug it in, 1, 6, 1, 0, 0, dot, 1, 1, minus 2, times 1, 1, minus 2. And of course, the 1 just picks out the 1 here, and we get 1 sixth times 
times 1, 1, minus 2, which you might as well write as 1 sixth, 1 sixth minus a third. And similarly, if you do 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, you get exactly the same thing. Because with a 1 in the second position, you just pick out that 1. So you're going to get 1 sixth, 1 sixth minus 1 third. And finally, if you do 0, 0, 1, now you'll pick out a minus 2. So we're going to get minus 2 sixths times 1, 1, negative 2, which minus 2 sixths is negative a third. So this is negative a third, negative a third, and plus 4 thirds. Okay, so I'm just going to finish off this part of the problem as in finding the projection onto the normal before I go on and actually finish the problem, although there's not that much more to do once you've done this. Did I make a mistake? Four sixths? Huh? Yeah, it's four sixths, isn't it? I did make a mistake. Four over six is two thirds. Thank you. Okay. So the matrix i.e. if proj v, projection x onto v is just a matrix times x, then A is the matrix whose columns are those three columns that I wrote. So I'm just going to copy them. 1 sixth, 1 sixth minus a third, and the second one is the same. 1 sixth, 1 sixth minus a third, and the third one is minus a third minus a third, and two thirds. And by the way, the answer has to be symmetric. If you didn't get a symmetric matrix, you made a mistake. It's just the way it is. Also, the diagonals have to be positive. That's just a little reality check. Doesn't mean you got the right answer, but at least it doesn't rule out a completely wrong answer. Yeah, it's pretty bleak. All right, sorry. Okay, so before I finish the problem, are there any questions about what I've just done? You know what the formula is, you just have to apply it to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, and then write down the matrix. A question first. We're not used to seeing the distance of the ve v vector being as v dot, v vector dot, v vector, so I'm used to just finding the Okay, so the question is, could you not replace the bottom, essentially, with the norm of v squared? No, the question is that when I do uh, find the distance of the v vector, I get like root um, 6. The question is, why is it not root 6 on the bottom? Yeah. Well, the formula for projection says x dot v over v dot v. So if you prefer, instead of the v dot v, you could use the distance, as in the length of v, squared. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you prefer to put that quantity on the bottom, that's okay, but it's still 6. Any other questions about what I've done so far? I've nearly finished the problem. All right. Please, don't anyone tell the fire marshal. All right. Okay, we've now found the projection. How would we find the reflection? Well, we, we know that the reflection of x in the plane is equal to x minus 2 times the projection of x onto the normal by the, by the uh, formula that I did. So we could work out what happens to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. But the best way to do it is to call this rx is equal to the identity times x minus 2 times ax. OK, so this is linear algebra. We want a matrix times x, because that's what we're looking for, the reflection matrix. The projection we know is a times x. So what's x by itself? We have to write that as a matrix. A nice little trick. Something is equal to 1 times the something. Okay, for matrices, you use the identity. So here, x is equal to ix. And of course, we're working in three dimensions, so it's i3x. So the matrix we're looking for is 1, 1, 1. 
minus 2 times this A matrix. And so here I'll have 1 minus a third is 2 thirds. And then 0 minus 2 sixths is negative 1 third. 0 minus, minus 2 thirds is plus 2 thirds. Then I have 0 minus a third. In fact, this is going to be symmetric too, so I can save myself a little bit of time. Uh, 1 minus a third, again, is 2 thirds. 0 plus 2 thirds. 0, well, here I can use the symmetry. I'll just get 2 thirds, and I should get another 2 thirds there. And finally, 1 minus 4 thirds is minus a third. I wonder if that really gives the answer to the answer. Okay, but if not, I quit. Uh, where is it? Have I lost it? Oh, I guess I get to stay. Okay. There you go. Right, so that's, that's the answer to the problem. Now, by the way, while we're at it, to do the projection onto the plane, as opposed to, this is a projection onto the normal, this top matrix here. To do the projection on the plane, we use instead the second formula here. So instead of taking away 2p, we just take away 1p. You see in the geometry over here, remember, we took away twice the projection, and that did the reflection. If instead we took away just once, then the only difference would be instead of this factor of 2, we just have a 1. And of course, you could compute the matrix. The first one would be 5 sixths instead of 2 thirds. And that would be the projection onto the plane. A question? So those have to be um, behavior rows. Question is, are these necessarily the columns and not the rows? OK, so in general, if you have a transformation and you know where 1, 0, 0 goes, then that's the first column of the matrix, right? And 0, 1, zero, zero is the same column. Now, in this case, because everything is symmetric, the rows and the columns are the same. So you can, for projections and reflections, they have to be symmetric. Yes, but most matrices are not symmetric. Some of them are not even square. Okay? Any other questions about this example? So I've given you all the tools you need to do any of these projections and reflections in three dimensions. These are really the only transformations that you consistently need to know in three dimensions in terms of finding explicit ones. In two dimensions, you need to be able to do these sort of projections and reflections as well, and it's almost the same sort of thing. But you also need to know about rotations and shears and scaling. Okay, so that's important. Yes, question? Can you go over, like, rotation in 2D? Could I go over Does anyone have a specific question about rotations in 2D? Okay. <laughs> you can be next. Well, before you go on, are there any other questions about this example because it, it's a hard one I mean I admit it is a, sort of intricate you need to know the formula plus geometry though and you can you can do it okay so no other questions about it then uh, no no okay, okay. another question about this yes yes where did the X go so I have the reflection of x in the plane is equal to x itself minus 2 times the projection. So this is written in terms of functions, right? Reflection of x. Think of it as a function. And there's another function. OK, now I want to write it as matrix. So this is r times x. The matrix times the vector is equal to x itself, which is the same as i3 times x, minus 2a times x. So you could actually factor both sides as rx equals i3 minus 2a <coughs> times x. And so what I said is, because that's true for all x, then r must be equal to i3 minus 2a. And there it is, OK? All right, so let's move on to the next problem, which is apparently going to involve rotations. And you're up. Oh, there you are. All right. Let me get my 
things in order. So that spring is not October, I'm guessing. No, I didn't think so either. Although it depends. If you're in Australia, it actually is. So that's why I get confused about this. Which uh, which problem was it? Two? Four. Yep. Sure, I'll show, you, I'll show you exactly how to do this. Uh, let L be the line where X minus Y equals zero. So L1, well, they've, L1 is X minus Y equals zero. L2 is X plus Y equals zero. So let's just draw these. They do it for us. First one is Y equals X. And the second is Y equals minus X. And the thing says, first you want to project onto L1, then rotate counterclockwise by pi over 4, and then reflect by L2, uh, reflect in L2. And they give an answer. Well, the question is, what is the matrix of T? So let's just, let's just write down what T is. T is project onto L1, then rotate pi over 4 counterclockwise, then reflect in L2. And the question is, what is the matrix of T? Now, the solution that they give is perfectly good. Remember, to find what a linear transformation does, and these are all linear, so their composition is linear. To find what a linear transformation does, all you need to know is where does 1, 0 go? go? And then you put those as columns of the resulting matrix. Okay? And here the thing will not be symmetric, by the way, so you have to put them as columns. Okay. Now, here's the deal. That's a perfectly good solution. I will go over it briefly, but I feel like you might want to see a more general solution of how to reflect and, 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 and rotate and all that. So I'll show you the other solution which would work if these lines were a little nastier and the geometry was harder, and also if the rotation was worse than pi over 4. So I'll, I'll give you the, the solution that they do is they say, OK, let's look at what happens to 1, 0. So here's 1, 0, that vector. Well, first, we're going to project onto L1. And it sort of just says, oh, you can see what that's going to do, right? Geometrically, you can see. Well, first of all, how do you see geometrically? What you do is you actually draw the projection. So it's, it's important to understand what it actually is geometrically. All you do is you drop a perpendicular from there to there, and this is the projection here. So we need to find that vector. Well, what's the length of that vector? This is an isosceles triangle. 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, and it's in the direction 1, 1. So it's clearly going to be, well, the length is 1 over root 2. So if it's a, a, which it has to be because it's in the direction, then we need a squared plus a squared equals a half i.e. 2a squared equals a half, a squared equals a quarter, so a equals a half, a half. So what I claim is that the projection, so we start with 1, 0. <coughs> this projects onto L1 as 1 half, a half. Now the solution just claims that. It doesn't explain that. So the way I've explained it is by using Pythagoras and then being a little bit, you know, I have to check the lengths. Okay, so maybe that's not very satisfactory, but that's what they've done. All right, now the next thing we have to do is rotate pi over 4. And they say, well, pi over 4, I mean, if I rotate this by pi over 4, I'm going to be somewhere on this axis here. I'm going to be on the y-axis. And what's more, the rotation doesn't change the length. So I still need to be length 1 over root 2. So the next step is going to take me to 0, 1 over root 2. And then finally, I'm going to reflect this vector in the line L2, which I can see geometrically will put me over here, down to minus 1 over root 2, comma 0, just by looking at it just by looking at it. 
And so that gives me actually the first column of the matrix. So I've written these as row vectors very naughtily, but it should be that T, i.e. T of 1, 0, or A times 1, 0, is equal to minus 1 over root 2, 0. Now, they do do something very nice and point out that the same thing would have happened without having to redo everything if you start with 0, 1 instead, by symmetry, the projection onto L1 is the same. And so the same for 0, 1, because once I project, everything else is the same. I get the same vector as the first step, a half, a half. So the rest of it keeps on going. So that A of 0, 1 equals minus, a half, uh, minus 1 over root 2, 0. And so the A matrix is just minus 1 over root 2, 0 in both columns. And they say minus root 2 over 2, which is the same thing. OK, so what I want to emphasize is, although that this is a perfectly good solution, it is not very general. It's not very adaptable. So it ought to be that we should be able to compute each of these three things, and then three matrices, and then multiply them together. So let's just see how to do that in general. It won't hurt. So the first thing we have to do is know how to do a projection. So first, let's look at projection. Well, in general, we use the same formula that I wrote down before. Now, this time, a vector along L1 happens to be 1, 1. So take E equals 1, 1. This is along L1. So all we want to do is project onto this line. So projection onto this V is equal to, well, its length is 2. So it's going to be x dot 1, 1 times 1, 1. And again, you only need to know what happens to 1, 0. You plug it in, you get a half times 1, 1. So already we see we get a half, a half. And similarly, you repeat for the other one, and of course you get the same thing. OK, so actually that verifies the first piece of geometry where we saw both of them get mapped to a half, a half. So in any case, the first matrix, the, ref the projection matrix, onto, so I call that P, that matrix is one half, one half, one half, one half, one half. That's the projection onto L1. Okay, so you can see it worked in this particular case. It came out to be the same, but I mean, if one one was any other vector, we could still do the same method, and we know the projection. Okay, so that's the first part. Now, what about the ro rotation? Well, the rotation in general Rotation by theta is cosine theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cosine theta. That will rotate by pi over 2. Now, I believe last time I screwed this up and I put the minus in the wrong place. So there it is, I think, in the correct place. Hopefully, once again, I did correct that or someone pointed it out. That's the counterclockwise rotation. Always counterclockwise is positive. Of course, if theta is negative, then you interpret it as clockwise by theta. But that the formula will work itself out. So it works for any theta. OK, so in, in our case, r pi over 4 is equal to cosine pi over 4 minus sine pi over 4 sine pi over 4 cosine pi over 4, which equals 1 over root 2 minus 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. So we found the, ref the uh, rotation matrix. Now we have to find the reflection matrix, so I'll show you how to do that. That's the, and then we will have seen almost everything, except for shears, for example. So let's see. The, the last thing we have to do is know how to reflect. So this is step three, reflect in L2. OK, so how do you find the reflection in two dimensions? Here's a line. Well, let's say here's a line L2 or L, whatever it is, 
it's not the correct line. And we have some vector v, and we want to know what happens when we reflect x. So what we want is to find this vector here. Well, I don't remember any formulas, I just know some geometry. I know that this vector here is the projection onto v. So what have I got to do? What have I got to do? I have to take this projection, and instead of going up, I have to go down. So this up vector here is x minus the projection. And indeed, if I add this back to the projection, I get the original vector x. But this vector here is negative of it, x minus the projection, because it goes in the other direction. So I need to add this to this. And I see that the reflection in two dimensions is equal to twice the projection of x minus x. OK, that's a little bit different from the formula in three dimensions. In three dimensions, we found that it was x minus the projection, x minus twice the projection. How come in two dimensions, it's 2 times the projection minus x? It's the opposite way around. How is that possible? Well, the answer is very simple. In three dimensions, we took away the projection onto the normal, twice the projection onto the normal. Whereas in two dimensions, it's more natural to just take away the projection onto the line. If you did the normal instead, then it would be the same formula as in three dimensions. But who wants to compute normals when you just have the vector itself? So unfortunately, it means the formula is sort of backwards. But if you understand the geometry, you won't have a problem. So anyway, in our case, the vector v is, say, minus 1, 1. That's going along the line L2, minus 1, 1. So the projection of x onto v is x dot v over v dot v, v, which in our case is x dot minus 1, 1 over minus 1, 1 dot itself times minus 1, 1. And if you plug in 1, 0, you get negative 1 over, there's always a 2 here, because the bottom is 2. So you get 1 half comma minus a half. And if you plug in 0, 1, you get a 1 instead. So let me get 1 half, one half times column. You get negative a half, one half. And so the projection matrix is equal to one half minus a half minus a half, one half times x. Now we still have to work out the reflection, and then we have to put all three together and see if we get the same matrix that we got before. Okay. So this is the other way of doing the problem. It's longer, but it's more general. OK, so the reflection of x is equal to twice the projection minus x. So it's matrix, which I will call, I don't know, s. I've already used r. Equals 2 times this matrix. I'll just call it 2 times this matrix, 1 half. Minus the identity. And so 2 times a half is 1, minus 1 is 0. 2 times minus a half is negative 1. It's symmetric, negative 1. And then 2 times a half minus 1 is 0. So that's actually the reflection matrix in that line. Great. So we now know how to find in general, a projection in two dimensions, a reflection in two dimensions, and a rotation. We found them all in this specific case. Now, how do we put them all together? Well, be careful. T is not equal to PRS. It's actually S 
or the matrix of T. is equal to S R, I'll just call it R, times P. Because we do the projection first, then the rotation, and then the reflection. Projection, rotation, and reflection. I'm sorry, I had to call the reflection S. Because I already the R. R. It's, it's a good get them in the correct order. Let's see what we have. S was 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. R was 1 over root 2, negative 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. And P, which we calculated first, is a half, a half, a half, a half. So we have three matrices to multiply, and because matrix multiplication is associative, we can do it in any order. Let's do this one times this first. 0 minus 1 gives us negative 1 over root 2. And again, negative 1 over root 2. And again, negative 1 over root 2. And just for variety, here's a plus 1 over root 2. Is that times that. And then we have to multiply this by 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. And what do we get? OK, the first is minus 1 over root 2 times a half plus another one. So it's just negative 1 over root 2. And the second column's the same, so we get a negative 1 over root 2. And then this times this is 0, because half of this with a negative cancels out a half of this with a positive, and then and the same reason we get zero. So we get exactly the same matrix, admittedly in a much more tortuous route, uh, route to get there, but, you know, as I said, we, this is a very general sort of methodology that would work pretty much for any L1, any L2, and any rotation you could, you could adapt this problem and do it, okay? So a question. Why do we do it in that order? Well, the problem said that you have to project onto L1, then rotate, and then uh, reflect in L2. Now, it's important to understand how composition works. When you do a composition of functions, the inside function is the one you do first, f of g of h. So h is the one we do first, then g, then f. So everything goes backwards. And so think of it as applying it to a vector x. So x first, you do px, so that means you do the projection first. Then you take that and do the rotation, and then you take that and do the reflection. So this is definitely a trap that you can fall in when you're composing functions. You have to do the one that you're doing first on the right. It seems counterintuitive, but that's the way that it works. Another question. Ah, so the question is, if it's associative, why doesn't B inverse A B equal A? Well, that would mean that it was commutative, in fact. So there's a difference between associative. What associative means is that to work this out, you could choose to do this multiplication first, then do the, the second one, or you could do these two and then that one. But it doesn't mean that you can reverse the order of the two, two of the matrices. So it's interesting that matrices are associative, or well, the multiplication is, but not commutative. There are some other number systems like octonians, whatever that means, which are neither associative nor uh, commutative. They're sort of weird. But we don't have to worry about those. All right, any other questions about this example? No. How many other people have questions that they want to cover, like it brought in? You can ask a question about this example first. In, in the book, they give uh, some formula for coming up with the projection vector u, and it's sort of u1 squared, u1, u2. Oh, yes. There is, a, there is a generic formula for the projection. And because I don't remember it, I don't teach it. But if you want to use that instead. But what, what would be, would we just take the unit normal vector, uh, not the unit normal, the unit vector? OK, if you wanted to use the formula from the book for two-dimensional projection involving u1 and u2, then what you do is you take your v and you make it into a unit vector first. By So instead of, say, in this example, 1, 1, right. you'd have to use 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2. And you get, of course, the same answer. By the way, here's an interesting thing. 1, 1 we used. I took a sum vector on the line. I said 1, 1. What if I'd used 3, 3, or minus 3, minus 3, or minus 7, minus 7? I get the same answer. You're not projecting onto the vector. You're projecting onto the line represented by the vector. In fact, when you divide by v dot v, 
in that formula, it automatically makes it into a unit vector. So it doesn't actually matter which vector along the line you want, the formula comes out the same. But if you do want to use the formula in the book, which requires a unit vector, then you'd better take some vector v and divide length to get the unit vector, and then you'll get it. Okay? Any other questions about any of this big example? So I just want a show of hands of how many people have a question about, like from a previous quiz that they'd like to go through. I have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, well, you're standing. You can go first because you've been so patient. Okay, so it's from uh, fall 06. Fall 06. Which, which, which problem? Number three, finding the inverse of a matrix. The question is, do you do brute force? The answer is yes. Does anyone want to see it? No. Do I have the answer? Yes, I, I, I think the answer to three was this. I didn't check it, maybe. Maybe I did. I forget. Seven-thirds minus one-third minus two-thirds. Two thirds, one third, minus one third, minus minus four, four thirds, thirds, one third, two thirds. And okay, so the way to check that is to multiply that by the matrix that's given and see if you get one, one, one. Okay? So since no one wants to see how to do it, which I'm quite happy about, uh, I move on to the next question. So uh, you had a question. Two from that same quiz. Okay, so the question was, is B, which equals 2, 2, minus 3, a linear combination of A1, which is 1, 1, 2, and A2, which is 0, minus 1, 3? Okay, what this is saying is, can we find B equals, say, x1 times x1, the number, times a1 plus x2 times a2? Is this possible? Can we find x1 times x2 possible? Or in other words, if we form a matrix, if A is the matrix whose columns are A1 and A2, and x is the vector x1, x2, and b is, as it was, 2, 2, minus 3, then this equation reduces to saying ax equals b. Does it have a solution? Can you, find, can you solve for x? Okay, just let's let's just check that. When you do ax, you get x1 times the first vector, which is a1, plus x2 times the second vector, which is a2. And that's supposed to be equal to b. Okay, so this is a fancy way of saying can you solve the matrix equation? And of course we know how to do those. We have to just do an elimination. So I'll, since this is a short one, I'll do it quickly and we'll see whether or not we can do it. And as a sort of bonus, if we can do it, we'll even find out what x1 and x2 work, or which possible ones work. So I start from 1, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, 3, 2, 2, negative 3. And I, I think I only have to do one step Gaussian elimination. This, I take away this first row from the second row. I get that, and if I take twice the first row away from the second row, I get 3, and then minus 3 minus is negative 7. And even without going further, I can see this is bad, because this equation says that minus x2 equals 0, whereas this equation says 3x2 would have to be equal to minus 7. And this one, of course, these two things are inconsistent. I mean, you can take it one step further, but already we can see no solution. So the answer is no. 
So the trick of the question is to interpret the words, is this a linear combination of blah, 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 and change it into a standard sort of, does this have a solution? Okay? Any questions about that example? The answer is no. But uh, any questions about it? Could you have done it such that uh, you're basically multiplying, matrix multiplying A by your X component and setting up three equations that way? Uh, the question is, couldn't you just do it component by component? Of course you could do it component by component. You just say x1 equals 2 and x1a you know, minus x. You, you could do it. But, I mean, that's the whole point of the matrices is to do it for you without, like, okay. dealing with variables. You basically, matrices are shorthand for writing out the variables. But, yeah, I agree. The, the question is simple enough that you could do it without matrices. You could have done it back in ninth grade. But now... I will now give you a system of seven vectors and, you know, 10 by 10 and say, is that a thing? And then, of course, there you want to do this Gauss-Jordan stuff because otherwise you'll be lost in a sea of variables. All right. Who else had a question? You have a question. Okay. Uh, is it the one that just says quiz number one? Covers chapters one and two of the test? Yeah. Okay. Um, five. five. E? C. B. Okay. So, 5B. This is the one where B is V1 plus 2V2? Okay. So, it says, let B be equal to V1 plus 2V2. It also says that A is the vector, the matrix whose columns are V1, V2, V3. And it doesn't tell us what A is, and it doesn't tell us what V, V1, V1, V2, or V3 are, but it does mysteriously tell us what would happen if you reduce this completely into echelon form, or reduced row echelon form, you get this matrix here. And the question is, given this information, so find all solutions to AX equals B. Interesting problem. Very interesting problem. Okay, well, what's one solution? How can we find one solution without... Okay, what do you think? Okay, so you are doing the second part of the problem where you're looking for not just one solution, but all the solutions. But I say that there's one obvious solution you have to find first. What do you think? One, two, zero. One, two, zero. Well, let's just see it. I agree with you. Let's take x equals one, two, zero. And you got that from one, two, and there's a zero v3 there that's, you can't see it, but it's ghostly. <laughs> Okay, so you take x is 1, 2, 0. Why is that a solution? Well, let's just take ax. This is v1, v2, v3 times this vector 1, 2, 0. And this gives you one lot of this whole vector plus two lots of this vector plus zero lots of this vector. And sure enough, that is b. See, there's also a ghostly one in here, but it's not quite as ghostly. All right, so you have ax equals b. So there is one solution. Now, imagine the reduced row echelon form of a was 1, 1, 1. What would that mean? It would mean a is invertible, right? If it's 1, 1, 1. It's a square matrix. A would be invertible. And therefore, this equation only has one solution, and that would be it. That would be it. This is a solution. The rank of this matrix is 2, which gives us one free variable. Gives us one free variable. And so the deal there is that there's got to be one degree of freedom then. Okay, so the question is, what is that degree of freedom? What are the other solutions to this equation? 
Well, if you think about it, when you reduce this whole sort of system, okay, down to the, the reduced row echelon form, you're also going to reduce v, B down to 1, 1, 2. No, 1, 2, 0. So this is, the, this is the nice thing, is that the reduced row echelon form of this. And of course, any solution to this, such as 1, 2, 0, will also be a solution to the original thing. So what is the other degree of freedom? Well, according to this, it says that if I call this vector k, well, let's, let's, let's say this coordinate is k. Well, let's not even do this. Let's just say this x3, x1 minus x3 equals 1, and x2 minus 3x3 equals 2. And so this means, I've run out of room. That's what it means. I, I want to come back to some, something I said before, but I'm going to push this through, and then I'll, I'll come back to something, and maybe this will also make it clearer. So I have then x1 is equal to 1 plus x3, x2 is equal to 2 plus 3x3. And therefore, x3 is equal to x3, the free variable. So this means that x, which is x1, x2, x3, is equal to 1, 2, 0, plus some constant k times 1, 3, 1. Okay, so those are the solutions. Now, before you ask the question, I just want to go back to something that I said. Maybe this is the, you don't even have to find one solution. Maybe you can just do it all in one step, if you understand the following. If you try to take the original A, B, which after all is equal to v1, v2, v3, and then here v1 plus 2v2. So this is the A part, and this is the B. If you reduce the row echelon form, you are taking multiples of this, this row minus this, and you're doing exactly the same B. What I'm claiming is that when you reduce it, in addition to getting whatever you've been given here, you are going to be reducing V, a B rather, to 1, 2, 0. That's the critical insight. If you have that insight, then you can solve the problem. Okay, and it's quite a tricky little insight in a way. It's not totally obvious by any means by any means. But there it is. Okay? And you can sort of see it, because you know this is one solution. So it has to look like this in general. It could not look anything else. It couldn't be anything else. Because when x3 is 0, you have to be able to get the solution that you found. So all other solutions come from that. All right. So what was your question? Was it about that? Any other questions about this? It, it's sort of subtle, but yeah. Uh, if it was v1 plus 2v3 was the solution, then this would be 1, 0, 2. And therefore, there wouldn't be any solutions at all, and the thing would be somewhat, yeah, it would be a, it's not consistent with the data given in the problem. So you would be able to say, I demand a recount, or something like that. All right, another question about this. OK, so the question is, how, did I, how come I wrote x3 equals x3? Whenever you have free variables, so if this is the reduced row echelon form, I see that x1 and x2 are taken, but x3 is free. So I have equations for x1 and x2 in terms of x3, but I want to know what's x3 in terms of x3 so that I can write this down very clearly. And I recall that, I mean, if you prefer, you can call it k, and then x3 is k, right? OK. So I know you have a question from the quiz. I oh, know about this. 
No, a different question. Okay. Quick question first. I don't think you can solve the problem if, uh, if there's 2v3, because that would mean that 1, 0, yeah, there we go, exploding short, 1, 0, 2 would be a solution. But 1, 0, 2 cannot be a solution. So the problem, it's not consistent with the data that's given. So I, that's why I say, if that was the actual question, you would have to say, no, 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 that's impossible. But it makes me think of another problem. A slight rephrasing. Here's a true or false problem. Here's a true or false problem. Here's a matrix A. Here's a vector B. And this time with the 3. And I'm giving you that the reduced row echelon form of A is the same as it was in the problem. And the question is, does AX equals B have a solution? And the answer is no, because when you reduce A from whatever it was blah, 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 down to this, B will get reduced because you're doing exactly the same operations on the columns of A. Whatever happens to V1, when you've, re okay, so when you've reduced V1, blah, 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 it's become 1, 0, 0. When you've reduced to V2, it's become 0, 1, 0. And V3 has become this. So whatever you do to V1, now is this true? Maybe I'm being stupid. Let's just examine this problem for a second, and then we'll come back to the others. OK, let's try this again. I think I am being a little silly. I think I am being a little silly. OK, so the question is, suppose the problem was v1 plus 2v3. OK, so what's going on? A is equal to v1 v2, v3, and let's now adjoin b, which is v1 plus 2, v3. So this is a, b. And the question is, what are the solutions to this? I'm, I've been asked to redo the problem like that, and I think I jumped to a conclusion that there were no solutions, and now I want to recount on my own lecture. All right, here's what happens. I reduce v1, whatever I do, V1 becomes 1, 0, 0. V2 becomes 0, 1, 0. And V3 becomes minus 1, minus 3, 0. So that means V1 in here goes to 1, 0, 0. And V3 So that's what I'm trying to say. So in particular, it reduces to solving this, minus 1, minus 6, 0, which you can solve. You can solve. Of course, I'm being silly because by my same logic, 1, 0, 2 is a solution. So. I was completely wrong when I said that the question wouldn't be correct. <laughs> Sorry about that to the people who already left. <laughs>
everything is linear. All these all transformation matrices we're doing to get from this matrix up the top to the matrix down the bottom are linear. It's pretty clever stuff. It seems a little subtle. All right, we better move on. You have a question? Yeah, it's from the uh, textbook. Textbook. Okay. Chapter 2, at end of the chapter, question 44. So this is the one that says, there exists a 3 by 2 matrix and a 2 by 3 matrix such that AB equals I3. Okay. So let me get this right. A is 3 by 2. And B is 2 by 3. So when you multiply AB, you're doing a 3 by 2 times a 2 by 3. And you will get a 3 by 3. And the question is, could they possibly be chosen so that you get the identity? All right, so these questions, this, this is a totally fair game problem that could come up. Now, did you try finding matrices that made it work? Why? But okay. But did you? So you, you looked up the answer and you saw it was false. But what if you didn't have the answer? How would you approach the problem? I I guess from the person that I've never got it right. Okay. So the things to guess you sort of try to have one one zero. You, maybe you try this, but it doesn't work. Okay. You can't. Ah, if it's the other way around, it has a hope of working. So why can this not work? Why can this not work? I agree that it's false. So how do you prove it? Sorry? With invertibles, we know that... Um, so the question is to prove it with invertibles. We know the cases we're talking about invertibles, but if okay. you know, they produce a... So for one thing, if A, okay, if A and B are square, and AB is the identity, then they are inverses of each other, and they commute. So we've seen this. But the problem here is really question... It's a question of rank. It's a question of rank. Now... Here's the problem. Essentially, what it comes down to is this. Do you know... Let's, let's call this matrix C. Yeah, question. First. Oh, you have a solution, okay. If it's I3, it means there are solutions for X, Y, Z. And if we are in the left matrix... Yep. Right, so it's to do with the rank, and, and you're sort of getting along the lines of what I'm trying to solve, what I'm trying to say here. If you have Cx equals zero for some matrix C, which I'm going to call AB eventually, all right, when does that have a unique solution? That's my question. When does this have a unique solution? Actually, let's call it A. Let's call it A here. And the unique solution has to be zero, by the way, because A times any matrix, is, uh, any matrix times zero is zero. So this is a really important fact that we're going to be finding here. We have a n by m matrix, and I want to... S so that's A, and I want to solve AX, where X is an m-dimensional vector, is the zero matrix is the zero vector of n size n okay and what i'm asking you is what is the important property about a that tells you whether or not that that equation has a unique solution okay the the one proposal is that its reduced row echelon form is the identity but the problem that will only work if m equals n in which case it's invertible but what if it's not invertible? When does this thing have a unique solution? Rank, M. Rank has to be M. Okay, this has a unique solution. X equals zero. If and only if the rank of the matrix A is M. Sorry, is M, not a vector. Okay, so why is it true? Why is it true? Basically, you don't want to have any column that does not have a 1 in it. 
because Colin Collins 101 are bad. Columns without a one give you a free variable. And if you have a free variable, then you have infinitely many solutions to AX equals zero. So otherwise, if the rank is less than M, then there are infinitely many solutions. Not just zero, but there's some other vector, which is actually in the kernel, which we haven't done yet because it's in chapter three, but it's the first part of chapter three. So I'm, you've actually seen it in class. AX equals zero has infinitely many solutions. There's no way you could have inconsistent because AX equals zero always has at least one solution, zero. What if the rank is than M? Who thinks that there are any solutions? OK, it was a trick. Yes, the rank cannot be bigger than M. OK, I'll, I'll, I'll abandon my trick. We don't have enough time. OK, so if the rank is the same as the number of columns, then it has one solution. OK, so now let's look at what happens here. If AB is the identity, if AB is the identity, then ABX is equal to x for all x. But in particular, I need more room. A, B is invertible. So, so if A, B equals the identity, then A, B is invertible, because it's the identity. So we've got an interesting problem here. I want to try to tie that in to the problem that A doesn't have full rank. OK? A question first. When you say A, B is invertible, does that mean A and B? No, it means A times B. Neither A nor B can be invertible, because they're not square. Right? Look over there for the dimensions. A is 3 by 2, B and 2 is 3 by 3. OK, so in particular, if A, B is the identity, then it, has, it happens to be invertible. OK, now here's the problem. We know that A, X equals 0 does not have a unique solution. Do I have this the right way? No, B. B, X equals 0. How do we know that? What's the rank of B? B looks like this. So what's the rank of B? It's at most 2. Because the rank can be no more than either the number of rows or the number of columns. It has to be less than or equal to both. So in particular, it's definitely no more than 2. There can be at most two ones. And therefore, there's a free variable. So, i.e., bx equals 0 for some x not equals 0. OK. When does bx equals 0 have a unique solution 0? When the rank of b is equal to the number of columns of b, which is 3. Okay, but the rank can be no more than 2. So in particular, there must be some free variable. That's another way of looking at it. There's only two rows and three columns, so there must be a free variable. And therefore, if I just took that one variable, then b times that <coughs> variable would be 0. Why? Here's the example from before. Okay, so we have, we want to solve this equals 0. So I have x1 minus 3x3 three equals 0, and I have x2 minus x3 equals 0. So I can clearly solve these two equations for where they are not all 0. Just let x3, the free variable, be 1, and it gives me a value of x1 and a value of x2 and a value of x3 that will satisfy the equations. Okay? <coughs> so if bx equals 0, then abx equals a times 0, which is 0. But this is supposed to be the identity. 
So in, in particular, x equals 0. But x is not supposed to be equal to 0. So there's a contradiction. So not only have we proved that it's impossible for AB to be equal to the identity, actually AB can't even be invertible. AB cannot be invertible because if it were, then again, the only vector that an invertible matrix times that vector is 0, because it's invertible, the answer must be 0. So if the question was AB for these dimensions is invertible, then it's, it's just as false. In fact, the rank of AB can be no more than 2, because that's the rank of B. So it's an interesting thing. B can't have more than 2 rank, so AB cannot have more than 2 rank. All right? When you say x equals 0, do you mean the whole thing is equal to 0, or just actually x equals 0? The x vector is okay. 0. OK, so just to, just to reiterate that, if c is invertible and cx equals 0, then what is x? c is invertible, cx equals 0, then x is 0. You can see it by multiplying both sides by c inverse, or you can just use the definition of invertible. There's only one solution to an equation, and 0 is always a solution to that. Okay? So actually, this shows that th this last line follows not just because AB is the identity, but even if AB was invertible, I could multiply both sides by the inverse of it and get x equals 0. And that's, that's, not, a, that's not valid because we know that BX is, well, we know x is not 0. So this is a subtle thing. This is a proof. Okay? It uses a result, and the result is that if the rank is less than the number of columns, there's not a unique solution. And it's tricky. Question about this. If it were BA, we would have a chance of finding? Yes, if it were BA, you can do it. You can do it if the thing is reversed. The same argument doesn't work because there the rank could be the same as the number of columns. And in fact, I'll give you an example. It's quite <coughs> easy to do it the other way around. So if instead of a 3 by 2 times a 2 by 3, if you have a 2 by 3, times a 3 by 2, and you want this to be the identity, of course, it's got to be a 2 by 2 identity instead of a 3 by 3 identity. And then I think if you do this, it probably works. Just check it, and you'll see that it works. It's almost as if that column and that column are completely superfluous, or that row. Okay, So it does work the other way around. It's pretty subtle stuff. It actually will make a lot more sense when we do image versus rank, uh, image and kernel rather. So to be, here's the geometry of what's going on. I, I feel like I should tell you. So B, in the original problem, B starts in three dimensions and reduces to two dimensions. And A takes the two dimensions and embeds it in three dimensions again. So B does this. And then A. And remember, when you write A, B, you're doing B first and then A. OK? So B is taking this in there and losing information and giving us just a plane. And then A can do no more. It cannot blow up this plane. The image of A can at best be some plane in space. So when I say the image, I mean all the vectors that you get when you do A can be at most a plane through the origin. It could be even a line or just zero. But the best you can hope for is some plane. right? So by doing B and then A, as in the transformation AB, you have collapsed space onto a plane. The identity doesn't do that at all. In fact, no invertible thing does that. Invertible things take all of space. They shuffle it around, rotate it, stretch it, whatever, linearly, but you end up with all of space. This cannot do it. So that's the geometry of what's going on. A question about that. OK, the question that was originally asked is, is it possible to, be a th to have a 3 by 2 times a 2 by 3, which, and, and then I switched it, right, OK. So, but you see the geometry of the situation. It, 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 this, is, this explains why it isn't possible to do it. Okay, I think we only had one more question, and then I really want to move on and do a little bit of chapter three, at least three point one. So it was you, it was your question, right? A, a true or false question? Okay, good. Which uh, which? Oh, it's.
textbook? It was on a quiz. Which quiz? Is it the unlabeled one again? Spring 2004? Five, which part? Um, 5D, if two matrices A and B have the same shape and the same rank, then you can obtain one from the other by row operations. Is that the one? Uh, actually, no. Sorry, B. Okay. So this is from spring 2004, and it's part B. And it says, if A... B and C are non-zero 2 by 2 matrices, and AB equals AC, then B equals C. Okay, so that's, you're asked whether it's true or false. Okay, so what if A, these are all square. So if A is invertible, is it true? Yes. How would you know? You just multiply on the left both sides of this equation by A inverse, and you would get B equals C. So as the solution says, the only hope is to try to take a non-invertible matrix A. <coughs> if this is going to be false, then A should be non-invertible. So what we'll do is we'll try the simplest non-invertible matrix. I agree with the solutions. I'll try this. So this is going to be B, and this is going to be C. And I want these to be different, and I want this to be true. So actually, this, whatever these numbers are, this, is going to, this 1 is going to pick out the first number here and the first number here, but these are all going to go away. So I could pick whatever numbers you like here, 5 and 6, as long as I put 5, 6 here. And then these can be anything, minus 1, well, let's call it 0, 0 here, and minus 1, 75,020. <laughs> okay, now we'll see if this is true. Let's just do a reality check. 1 times that, I get 5. 1 times that, I get 6, 0, 0. And if you do it here, you'll get the same thing. 5, 6, 0, 0. But these matrices are not the same. So it's a sort of, I don't have a nice theorem, but as I was trying to say, most of these true-false problems, if you haven't learnt it or they don't have something to do with rank that's clever, then probably there's some, uh, there's some it's probably false and you have to scrounge around and find a counterexample. Okay, so that's the general philosophy. All right, any questions about that example? That, that... Oh, no, no, no. There are, you, there are many choices of A, B. I mean, for example, you could have put the 1 down there. But actually, it's probably true that if A is any non-invertible matrix, then you can at least find B and C that make that work. But I don't know. I haven't thought about it. And since I'm making so many mistakes nowadays, I, I don't want to think about it. All right, so here's a, another question about this first or a different question? Do I have any more general advice about proofs? Well, not really. It helps to know the theorems. I'll give you that. Did you have another question? Okay. How many other questions are there still? Might as well ask one. Okay. Well, I know you have a quiz, but uh, I do have to cover this material as well. Okay. You know what? I'll take. Okay. I'll take the one more question, and then I will do 20 minutes on. A true false question. Okay, so you want a squared to equal 1101, where a is upper triangular. Okay, let's try it out. Let's try it out. A is upper triangular. Okay, so the question is, is there an upper triangular matrix A such that A squared equals this? 
So you have to know what an upper triangular matrix looks like. So rather than do a general theory, it's only two by two, so we might as well let A be equal to little a, little b, zero c, and work out what A squared is. A, B, zero c, A, B, zero c. You do the multiplication, and by the way, you should expect to see uh, an upper triangular matrix. That, that's a useful fact, that the product of two upper triangular matrices is upper triangular. So you get A squared, here you get A, B, plus B, C. Here you get 0, as expected, and here you get C squared. Okay, so this is supposed to equal 1, 1, 0, 1. So you try to solve this. First of all, we need A squared equals 1. You need AB plus BC equals 1. And you need C squared equals 1. So according to this, A has to equal plus or minus 1. C has to equal plus or minus 1. And B has to equal 1 over A plus B, uh, plus C. Well, you don't want to choose A as 1 and C as minus 1, but I rather think that if you choose A equals 1, C equals 1, and B equals a half, that ought to work. So let's just do a reality check. 1, a half, 0, 1, times 1, a half, 0, 1. You get 1, you get a half times a half plus a half times a half is 1, 0, 1. Okay, brute force solved it. Okay. There's no theorems, so it was only two by two, so I figured I could brute force my way. Okay, you're welcome. All right, so now some chapter three. So anyone who, well, yes, some question. Chapter three question. Okay, you can ask a, I haven't talked about it yet, but you can ask a general question about the three if you want. Yeah, maybe you can ask me afterwards because since it's not the quiz, I'm going to just, uh, I, I have to start it before I can ask, answer it for the moment. Okay. Could I do a shearing problem? I didn't. No one asked me one. So if you have one, not really. Just the only thing I've seen is that shears are, are uh, invertible. Okay. I can't take a break because there's no time, but I can take one minute. For anyone who wants to leave, to leave, good luck on the quiz, by the way. And for anyone who's sitting down and wants to, like, sitting down on the floor and wants to stay to move to somewhere more comfortable. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, three weeks, and anyway. All right. I'm just going to be able to get through 3.1 if I'm lucky. So, here goes. In order to, well, I want to talk a little bit about subspaces. Before I do that, that's in 3.2. I will show you something about the span of vectors and linear combinations. Okay, so. I'm given a bunch of vectors, v1 up to, say, v, how many have I got? m. Okay, they're n-dimensional vectors, each of them. And I want to say that span of v1 up to vm is equal to the set of all linear combinations of these vectors. It's a set. So just to remind you what linear combinations are, this means it's the set of C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus Cm Vm for all possible <coughs> choices of C1 up to CM, where these are just numbers, these are scalars. Okay, so these are linear combinations, no problem. 
So what does this look like geometrically? Well, if that's v1 and this is v2, and what I'm saying, and these are in the plane, and what I'm saying is I can actually take any multiple of v1 plus any multiple of v2. And so if you think about it, here's a, a point. Well, if I went, okay, that's not a very good point. Here's a point. If I went, say, back here along v1 and then along here, along the v2 direction, so I start at 0 and I go this much of v1, which is negative, and this much of v2, I get to this point. And if you think about it, I can actually get to any point, no matter where it is, by something along those lines. So like to get down here, I have to go back again a little bit. In fact, the easiest way to see it is to go back along here first and then as long as I'm parallel to v1 and v2 in some order, I will get there. Now, if these vectors are in space, here's v1 and v2, then the span gives me the plane through these two, because I can actually get to anywhere on the plane, but I cannot pop off the, the plane that's given by these two. Now, what if v1 and v2 are back in the plane on the blackboard again, but v1 is this, and v2 is back here? Well, the span of these two is the same as just the span of v1 by itself, which is the whole line. v2 doesn't give me anything extra. Okay? So now, that's starting to lead into linear independence. But what I want to point out about the span is this. This is related to matrices. What you do is you take a, vector, a matrix A and you write V1 and Vm as the columns of that matrix. So it's an N by M matrix. And if C is equal to C1, Cm, then AC is exactly this vector. So in other words, the span is equal to the set of AC for any vector C. Any C. All right, so this leads us to the notion of image or range, i.e., this is the range of A. But we've agreed that in this course we're not going to be using range, we're going to use image instead for linear transformations. It's, it's the standard word, image. Okay, so what is the image again? Just to remind you, we have this function or transformation T. It goes from Rm to Rn. The image of T, which is normally written mt, is equal to the set of all vectors Tx, where x is in Rm. So it's the range of T. It's the range of T. It's what you get if you take any starting vector and then hit it with T and you repeat, and you do it over and over again, and you map out some sort of part of Rn, which may be all of it, or may not be all of it. It depends. But whatever you get, it's called the image. And what I'm trying to tell you is that if A is the matrix of T, so that its columns are V1, Vm, then the image is the span of the columns. Okay, so if T has a matrix A, the associated matrix A, where T of X, as usual, is A times X, then the image of T is equal to the span of all the columns of A. Okay? So it just makes complete sense when you look at this. I'm taking every possible vector C in this case, this mental vector, and seeing what I get. Question? I don't understand the span until the matrix that I have. Well, the span is all these linear combinations. Okay, so the point is I've got V1 and Vm, but I can pick any numbers C1 up to Cm. 
and see what I get, right? If you write this in matrix notation with A being the matrix like this and C being the vector, then if you actually work out what AC is, it's equal to this linear combination. That's, that's the definition of the matrix vector multiplication. Right, so the point is that instead of saying choose any numbers C1 up to Cm, I'm saying choose any vector C. And then I hit it with A, and I see what I get. And I repeat for multiple vectors. And all I did here was change C to X and A to T. Okay? So that's sort of an intuitive idea. Now, notice, first of all, I'm going to show you some properties of image. So important thing about the, about the image. The range of a function in general can be pretty strange, but the range of a linear transformation cannot. It has to be what's called a subspace. And that's in 3.2, as I said. But just to illustrate the main properties of the image of a linear transformation, T, of course, is linear, uh, here are some important properties. So first of all, 0. And remember, this is, just to remind you, remember it's a subset, in fact, a subspace, but let's just say subset of Rn. It's not in the domain, it's in the codomain. It's an n-dimensional thing. T takes an m-dimensional vector and gives us back an n-dimension. So the image, which is the range really, has to be n-dimension. So the first thing is that the n-dimensional zero vector is in the image. How do you prove that something is in the image? You have to find something that t takes to 0. Well, of course, t of 0 is 0. And this is the m-dimensional 0. So just to be, this is an n-dimensional 0 here, because so I'm, I'm kind of putting the dimensions there. So that's sort of obvious. Now, here's a second property. If x is in the image, what does it say? V and W. Well, whatever. If V and W are in are both in the image, so is V plus W. So if any two vectors are in the image, so is their sum. Why? Well, what does it mean for V to be in the image? Can anyone tell me, if V is in the image, then what can I say for sure? Well, multiples of V, that's the third property. So just to say that V is in the image means what? No. There's some vector that gets sent to V. So if V is in the image of T, this means it's a really good skill to be able to transfer this to say there is an X, maybe more than one, but... There is at least one x with tx equals v. And vice versa. This is an if and only if. If there is an x, then v is in the image. And if v is in the image, then there's some x. Okay, there's some x that gets sent to v. So similarly, there's some y, also there's a y, and remember x and y are m-dimensional, whereas v and w are n-dimensional, but that's all taken care of. There's also a y with t of y equals w. Okay, so I ask you this, what is t of x plus y? Well, it's a linear transformation. So t of x plus y is t of x plus t of y, which is v plus w. So this means that v plus w is in the image. Why? Because there's a vector that goes to it, and that vector is x plus y. See, these have, this is how these little proofs work. Not a very key trick for, for kind of cute anyway. And then the third property that's really important, which I'm not going to prove, but it's no more difficult than that, is if V is in the image of T and K is real, K is a scalar, 
then KV is also in the image of T. So scalar multiples of vectors in the image are in the image. So basically what it means is the image being the span of vectors has to be what's called a subspace. So for example, it could be a plane through the origin. It could be a line through the origin. It could just be the origin itself. But it cannot be some subset of a plane that's not the whole plane. It could be a three-dimensional space embedded in four dimensions or something more complicated than that. But it has a linear sort of structure. And again, I'm hinting at a subspace here. Except the notion of the image. OK, we'll come back to image later. But the last thing I wanted to say is what the kernel is. So this is a little bit different, but it will turn out to be somewhat related. So I've got, again, a T from Rm to Rn. This time, I want to try to consider Kerr of T, the kernel of T. It's the set of all vectors x in Rm. This is now the domain, such that T of x is the zero vector in Rn. So it's different from the image in many ways. First, the image lives in here. So here's Rm. <coughs> Bless you. Image lives in here. Whereas the kernel lives in here, in the domain. Things get a little more confusing when m equals n. But when they're not, there's no way of confusing them. You have to know which one is which. Kernel of t lives in Rm. It's all the vectors that t sends to 0. Okay, It's the vectors that t destroys. Okay, So we're going to apply the same thing. First of all, 0, this time the m vector, is in the kernel of t. And here, you don't even have to do anything fancy. You just note that t of 0 is 0. And remember, the kernel is all the things that get sent to 0. Well, 0 gets sent to 0, so 0 is in the kernel. OK, 2. If x and y are in the kernel, so is x plus y. Sounds very familiar. That's the second property we did with the image, but I'm using x and y instead. Of the n-dimensional 0 is in the kernel. It can't possibly be the n-dimensional because kernel t lives in the m-dimensional space. OK, so that's the first property. Now, as for the second property, if the x and y are in the kernel, so is their sum. This is actually easier to prove than the image. What does it mean to say that x is in the kernel? We know x is in the kernel. What does that mean? It's a fancy way of saying that t of x equals 0. Also, t of y happens to be equal to 0, because it's in the kernel. So t of x plus y is just tx plus ty. But both of these are 0. So this is 0 plus 0, which of course equals 0. So x plus y is also in the kernel, because it gets sent to 0. And actually, the scalar property is just as easy to prove as well, and I'll leave that to you. If x is in the kernel, then kx is in the kernel for any scalar k, real number, basically. So I leave the proof of that to you. OK, so both the image and the kernel turn out to be subspaces. And I cannot really reveal the connection between the two of them just yet. But I do want to say a few more words about the kernel, because actually, this one is quite easy to, uh, to relate to what we've already looked at. OK, so to find the kernel, I'll show you how to do the image later, next time. But how would you find, e, e.g., if tx equals ax, where a 
is this matrix, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. So T, of course, goes from R3 to R2. You can tell that just from the size of the matrix. Find kernel of T. Well, all you have to do is solve AX equals 0, i.e. 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 0, 0, 0. That's what you have to solve. Question, what quick. Oh, wait, I've got this the wrong way around. <laughs> what do I mean? I'm just tired. Yes, you hit this with a 2 by 2 vector, is what I mean. And you get a three dimensional vector back. Yeah, 2 to 3. OK, so that means you have to solve. But notice that you can't get it wrong if you do it in matrix notation, because you're going to have to find, I mean, you can't stick two dimensions here, and you'll see that we get the right answer. So even if I had persisted with my lunacy. Anyway, so I have 1, 1. And the beautiful thing about zeros on the right is that it doesn't affect anything in the elimination. So you got this minus this, and you get 0, 1. And then this minus this, and you get 0, 2. And so if you reduce this further, you get 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And so actually, the only solution to this is that x1 equals x2 equals 0. That's the only solution. And so what you will find is that curve of t is just equal to 0 in this case. But the point is that we knew how to solve a x equals 0 already. All I've done is give it a name and formalize the problem. Find curve t means solve t at tx or a x equals 0. Quick question. Uh, if you want to, oh yeah, yeah. I shouldn't call it x and y, I should call it x1, x2. It's much more flexible, you see, you can do multiple dimensions. Quick question. Yeah, will, will it always be true that if you have a rank equal to the number of columns, the kernel is zero? Yep, if the rank equals the number of columns, then ax equals zero has the unique solution, which is what I said earlier, zero. which means the kernel is zero. zero. Okay. Yep. And if the rank is not, then the kernel will be non-zero. Right, but in fact, there's a more general theorem that the dimension of the kernel plus the dimension of the image, whatever that means, we haven't said about dimensions, but the number of vectors in there is equal to the number of columns of the matrix. So that's, that's the big punchline of the theorem. Quick question. Just explain the R2, R3 part. Oh, well, I, I just kind of screwed this up. I mean, in general, if you have an n by m matrix, then the only th it has to operate on a vector in R and n. You back you R and n. So you just read it. Yep, the number of columns to the number of rows. Otherwise, you can't even multiply the matrix by a vector. So I, I was just confused. To, I'm tired. I'm confused. OK, so in fact, you are absolutely right. And that's the next thing I was going to say. If you have an n by m matrix, as we do, or chant i.e. t goes from rm to rn, same thing, then exactly what I just said, the kernel of t is the zero vector only if and only if the rank of t, or the rank of the matrix, is equal to m. In that case, there's only one solution to tx equals zero. If the rank, i.e., if the rank is less than m, then the kernel is not zero. There are some vectors which are not just the zero vector, which get annihilated by t. t of them goes to zero. So the oh, only the last punchline then of, of the section, and then we'll stop. And next time I'll start with 3.2, which is not a big deal, um, is that there was some more characterizations of invertible matrices, which I should just characterizations of invertible matrices. Invertible matrices. So we sort of basically say that A, which is square, n by n, is invertible if and only if, if and only if 
It's IFF is an abbreviation. So we already said, here, here's a sort of recap of what we've seen. So AX equals B has a unique solution. X for every B. That's the definition of invertible. It has a one precise solution to any equation of that form. Um, okay, so, well, <laughs> it's also true that if AX equals zero has a unique solution and A is square, then it's invertible. So it only needs to be true for, for X equals zero, for, for B equals zero. But if it is true, then it will also be true for any vector. And the solution, by the way, is x equals a inverse b. Right? So if you prefer, I'll add this to the book, although it doesn't specifically say it. Well, what the hell? It does say it. It just says it in another language. <laughs> it says also the reduced form is i n. That's the same thing, or it means the same thing. 3 is that the rank of a equals n, that's good enough. If that's true, then that automatically implies this because it's square. If it's not square, it's not necessarily true. In fact, no non-square matrix can be invertible. Um, cur of A, which is the same thing as cur of T, it's just zero. I.e., AX equals zero only has the solution x equals 0. So this goes along to what you were saying. It's actually true that if a is square and ax equals 0 only has the solution x equals 0, then ax equals b only has one solution. It's enough. It's, it's obvious that this one implies this one. You just pick b equals 0 and you say, okay, it has a unique solution, but it's not obvious that the reverse is true. But because it's linear, it is. If that's the case, then the reduced form must be the identity, and therefore it only has one solution. And finally, if the image of A is all of R n, that's good enough as well. That's good enough as well, because what it will mean is that the rank is n. So we can't quite, the book sort of justifies this, and that's fine. It means that there is a solution, but we'll see more about why this is related to this. There's something, there's a big connection between the rank and the image that I'm not quite prepared to say what it is yet. Okay, uh, I think we better stop the video at this point, but I will take some questions afterwards.